بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. Shall I continuing on with our uh, series on the life of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, Asirat al Nabawiya? In the la- in the previous session, we talked about the Prophet, of, or rather, the last couple of sessions, we've talked about the marriage of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to his beloved wife Khadija radhiyallahu anha. May Allah be pleased with her. And we talked about and discussed. Um, many different aspects of that marriage, what exactly happened, uh, historically speaking. We talked about, extracted some lessons in terms of why they married, how they married, exactly what transpired in terms of that marriage. And then we also took a brief overview, a synopsis of the overall marriage of the life of the Prophet ﷺ to Khadija radiallahu anha. How long that marriage lasted and exactly, you know, the children that were born from that marriage and some of what transpired overall just as a brief overview. And of course, we'll be talking more about Khadija radiallahu anha as we progress and as we move through the life and the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because when we talk about the beginning of Revelation in a few weeks, um, Khadija radiallahu anha played a very important role at the beginning of the wahi at the beginning of divine revelation. When we talk about some of the early sacrifices, the boycott and the shu'ab of Abi Talib, we'll again talk about Khadija radiallahu anha and her sacrifices. We'll eventually talk about the passing and the death of Khadija radiallahu anha. And not only that, but when we move on even into the Medinan period, whenever that may be, we'll also be talking about how at different points and times during the Medinan period, which is years and years, even so, as much as a decade after the passing of Khadija radiallahu anha, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to remember her, and he continued to what we call in English, honor her memory. Where he remembered her, and he would remember her very fondly, and he would speak about her, and praise her years after she had passed away. But we'll talk about that when we come to that point. So we discussed how according to the majority of narrations, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was 25 years old at the time of his marriage to Ummul Mu'mineen Khadija radiallahu anha. May Allah be pleased with her. The next 10 years of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa life are a period from the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa a period in the seerah in which no major incidents are mentioned. There are no major incidents events, occurrences. Because you also have to understand that when, when you recount the life of a person, when you tell the life story, the biography of an individual, usually the timeline of a biography is marked by major events and occurrences. So you don't literally document every single day that he woke up in the morning and then he had breakfast and then he went to work and then he came home, then he took a nap and then he ate evening, he ate dinner and then he went to sleep. You don't document someone's life in that manner because that is assumed. That's something that's just assumed. That's something that we generally know about. We will talk a little bit about what do we generally know about the life of the Prophet I'll mention in just a minute. But just, I wanted to start off by you know, kind of explaining that when you document someone's life, a biographical account of someone, uh, of a person is marked by the timeline when you look at it of someone's life, whose life has been documented um, or been chronicled, it is done by marking the major events and occurrences and situations from the life of that person. And that basically forms the timeline and those are the major things that you talk about. When we talk about this particular phase of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, from the age of 25 to the age of 35, there are no major events, situations, occurrences, incidents. There's nothing major that occurred here. But what that does is that tells us two things. There's even a lesson in that. The first thing I'd like to mention is, what do we generally typically know about the Prophet ﷺ, that what can we understand? Not just assume, but what can we draw as conclusions as to what was the tone of these 10 years? Because these weren't just 10 years. 25 to 35 is the prime of someone's life. So it's also kind of interesting that we don't have some major events, occurrences, situations, circumstances during the prime of someone's life. But at the same time, what we also what we also have to take into account is, while this is the prime of his life, this is also the first 10 years of his marriage. This is the first 10 years of his marriage. This is the first 10 years, this is the 10 years in which he established a home and a family. 
He settled down. He built a marriage. He had majority of his children were born during this first 10 year period. So there's a lot of very interesting things. So based off of that, what we know generally speaking about the life of the Prophet ﷺ is, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ says, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ That the best amongst you is the one who is the best amongst you to his family. So the best amongst you, the one that is the, the best person among people, is the one who treats his family the best. وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي And the Prophet ﷺ says, and I am the best to my family. When we look at some of the advice, the recommendations, the wisdom, the instruction, the guidance of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, which we refer to as the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ, or the hadith, right? The actual instruction and guidance from the Prophet ﷺ. When we look at that, which was, which was after Nubuwa, after Prophethood, much later on, but it's still the Prophet ﷺ making recommendations and giving advice. When we look at that, when we read that, when we listen to that, when we hear that, what we find is the Prophet ﷺ emphasizing the family life. We see the Prophet ﷺ talking about, you know, sharing quiet, private, quality time with one's spouse. We see the Prophet ﷺ talking about literally, you know, um, intimately, like how a couple, when they share an intimate moment, the Prophet ﷺ actually makes mention of, you know, feeding one's own wife with one's own, with one's own hand intimately. Right? Like intimately, like sharing food. We see the Prophet ﷺ talking about eating together. We see the Prophet of Allah ﷺ talking about even the physical intimacy with one's spouse. That the Prophet ﷺ is instructing Sahaba who are getting married, that even physical intimacy with one's spouse should not be treated as a chore. It shouldn't be treated like going to the restroom where you just relieve your need. That the Prophet of Allah ﷺ tells us even physical intimacy with one's spouse is not like relieving yourself in the restroom. It's not relieving yourself of a need. Where you just go, you just get it done as soon as you can and then you move about the rest of your business actually get back to something more productive. But the Prophet of Allah ﷺ actually recommends to young sahaba who are getting married to engage in more... to basically to when, when they engage in physical intimacy with their spouse, to engage wholeheartedly, to put time into that, to invest energy and time into that. Basically what is referred to as, and this is kind of an adult topic and I realize that, but there, there's really no way else to mention this. Um, but the Prophet of Allah Wasallam talks about engaging in foreplay when, when approaching one's spouse for physical intimacy. That it shouldn't just be intercourse. But rather the Prophet ﷺ recommends very strongly, very adamantly recommends to the Sahaba to engage in foreplay. So we see the Prophet of Allah ﷺ emphasizing the relationship with one's spouse. We see the Prophet of Allah ﷺ talking about that even if you are, mashallah, religiously inclined and spiritually motivated, that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ says that ibadah and worship doesn't necessarily have to be something that you have to depart yourself from your family from, but it's something that can actually be done as a family activity. Where the Prophet of Allah ﷺ would wake up his own family members in the night when he would offer the prayer in the night. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ even taught the Muslims, he taught us, that when you wake up to pray in the night and you find your spouse asleep, then wake them up to pray with you. وَأْمُرَ أَهْلَكَ بِالصَّلَاةِ وَاسْتَبِرَ عَلَيْهَا That not only should you pray, but you should tell your family to pray. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ would offer the fard, the obligatory prayers, the three rak'at of maghrib that we just offered. He would come and he would offer that in the masjid and congregation in jama'ah. But the two sunnah afterwards that we pray, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ would go back home and pray that with his family. He would go back home and he would offer that with his family. He would pray that in the home, in the house. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ recommended spending time with one's family. It was part of his own sunnah that after Salatul Asr, after engaging in some adhkar and remembrance of Allah, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ would actually go and visit the homes of his wives after Salatul Asr, which is the daytime. He wouldn't just wait till it was 10 p.m. at night and then finally return home once everybody's already asleep and the wife is basically just waiting up so that you can get home, so that you know she can give you some food or whatever it is and everybody just passes out. The Prophet wouldn't do that. During the daytime, during the daytime, after Asr, he would go and he would check on his family. How's everybody doing? How's everything going? 
How was your day? What's going on with you? What about your, you know, what's going on with this? What's going on? He would engage with his family during the actual daytime, the daylight hours. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, one of his sunnah was the qaylula, was the after, was the noontime nap. He would go home and he would take that nap at home. So he would actually, it's like lunch break. During your lunch break, and the Prophet Sallallahu during his lunch break would actually go home and spend that time with the family at home. These are all from the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And in fact, we have this documented from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during the Medinan years. Not just the Meccan years, but even the Medinan years. Meaning what? During the Medinan years, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not just a Prophet, not just a Nabi, not just a Rasul. He's not just the Imam, he's not just a Mu'allim, and the Muslih, and the Murshid. But the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he's not just the Imam, and the teacher, and the leader, and the, the trainer, the spiritual trainer. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, on top of everything, is the head of state. He's running a government, he's running an entire Islamic state in al Madinatul Munawwara, the blessed city of Medina. And in spite of all of that, he still look, just look what I described. Eating food at home with the family, going home and visiting the family in the afternoon time. Going and praying your sunnah with the family. Waking up in the middle of the night and offering prayers with the family. Engaging in physical intimacy. Again, like I said, not just like using the restroom, just not just relieving a need. But the Prophet of Allah actually treats it as quality, private, intimate time with his spouse. To do that every single day, while running in Islamic State and being the Nabi and the Rasul of Allah and being the Imam of His people, it's unbelievable, it's remarkable. But that only happens when it's a priority for you. When you prioritize it. The Prophet would engage in the education of his children himself. Again, we have the account of the later years, by that time most of his children were grown up, but the tasbih that we offer after salah, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, that we offer in the morning and the evening, to, to, to say that tasbih before going to sleep at night. Where did that tasbih come from? It's called the tasbih of Fatima. At tasbih Fatimi. The tasbih of Fatima. It's the, the tasbih that the Prophet ﷺ taught to his own daughter Fatima. Hassan and Hussein, they were taught the deen by their grandfather, the Messenger of Allah ﷺ. He taught them how to pray. The qunut nazila, Allah mahdini fi man hadayt. Where did that come to us from? It's narrated by Hassan, the grandson of the Prophet ﷺ. It says, My grandfather, the Messenger of Allah, Rasulullah, may Allah, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shower his peace and blessings upon him. He's the one that taught me the qunut nazila, Allah mahdini fi man hadayt. So the Prophet ﷺ even taught the deen to his own family. So we see that the Prophet ﷺ had a very strong emphasis on family life. So based on what we know about the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, even later in his life, you can just imagine how invested the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was into spending time with his family during the early years of his family life, during the early years of his marriage, during the, you know, the birth and the formative stages of his own children. He was there for them, he was spending time with them. So the fact that there isn't a huge, like there aren't many, many huge events and details that are mentioned in these 10 years, aside from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that nothing major happened, but we can also, what we can read into it, and the actually classical scholars of the seerah do mention this fact, that what we can understand about that is, that during this time the Prophet ﷺ was so heavily invested into his family life, that there wasn't a lot of time for him to be politically active or doing something major outside. But he was focused in between his family life, and in between, of course, making a living and earning a living, he continued doing business. And that was basically the, the majority, the bulk of the time to which the Prophet ﷺ dedicated his time. Now of course, once the sharia of the Prophet ﷺ, once the deen was fully revealed, or was rather being revealed, and as spiritual obligations were being revealed, then we were commanded and we were taught, and the Prophet ﷺ, Uswatun Hasana, was the ultimate exemplar, was the best example on how to implement spirituality within that, the, that framework, that how to pray five times a day, and do tasbih, and dhikr of Allah, and recitation of the Qur'an, and contribute something to your community, along with family time and family obligations, and being a responsible father and husband, and earning a living, a halal living. The Prophet of Allah ﷺ says, كَسْبُ الْحَلَالِ فَرِيضَةٌ بَعْدَ الْفَرَائِضِ The Prophet of Allah ﷺ says, 
that earning a lawful income is an obligation after the, the spiritual main obligations. Meaning, it's also an obligation upon a father and a husband to earn a lawful income. So the Prophet of Allah ﷺ was primarily engaged in this during this early time of his life. And so not, I told you two things. Not only is that something that we can naturally understand and we can draw from these 10 years, 25 to 35, this time, this lifetime, this time from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that he was very much preoccupied with his family and doing the tarbi and spending time and raising and building a home and a family. But the second thing that we can also understand from this is that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, this was his primary engagement and activity. And oftentimes, you know, and, and this rhetoric unfortunately is very, <coughs> is very prevalent in our communities. This is something I've spoken about a number of times before, even here. That we have some very unfortunate rhetoric um, in our community a lot of times that it's very prevalent in our community where time spent with the family or time invested into one's own family is considered as downtime. It's considered as unproductive time. It's considered time that could have been, you know, better invested into something else. Now that goes back and depends on the perspective of the individual, the priorities of the individual. If somebody is very materialistically focused, like somebody is very focused on worldly success, I put that in quotation marks because that's a definition of a person of success. It's not the Islamic or Quranic definition of success, right? But when somebody is very focused on being successful from a worldly perspective, then when somebody is working overtime and working a side job and doing this and doing that and enrolling into a graduate program and doing all of this during the early years of a person's marriage and when they're having kids and their kids are small, basically being an absentee husband or father, then that's considered somebody who's motivated, somebody who's ambitious. Versus that if there's another person, a friend or a brother or a cousin or somebody else, who just basically works his nine to five to be able to put food on the table for his family and be a responsible husband and father financially speaking, but then would much rather invest any and all extra time into his family and spending time with one's family and teaching his own children how to read and spending time with his own kids and his own wife, then that person's considered lazy. That person's considered to be not very career oriented. Yeah, he's not because he's family oriented, which is a much better investment of a person's time. But then that same rhetoric also ex exists in amongst people who are more religiously inclined. That if somebody, you know, prays their fara'id, comes to the masjid to pray salah bil jama'ah as much as they can, you know, yeah, preferably five times a day. But you know, practically speaking, if somebody's going to work during the daytime, so they come for fajr and then they come back in maghrib and maybe come for isha, lohr and asr, they're usually at work or something like that. They just pray their fara'id in the masjid, they come to Jumu'ah for the masjid, and you know, just a little here and there, maybe attend some type of a halaqa or a class or a program on the weekend as a family. But outside of that, any and all extra time that they have, they would much rather again spend that at home. Recite Qur'an at, with their children at home. You know, teach deen to their own family at home. Spend quality time as a family together. That if they're willing to do that, then once again that person's considered not to be very community oriented. Yeah, they're not because they're, once again, they're family oriented, which I would argue is actually being more community oriented. Because a community is just a network of healthy families. And when we have unhealthy families and we have broken homes in the community, that's a very unhealthy community. And that actually brings more problems back to the community. So it's actually more detrimental to the community. But such a person is considered to be not very spiritually inclined. Or not very you know, active in the community. And somebody who's not very involved or not very religiously motivated. And that's actually very, very incorrect. Because that person is investing into the akhirah. قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِكُمْ نَارَ Save yourselves and your families from the fire of hell. That's our first and foremost responsibility. I, I shared this with the students um, that I, I was teaching hadith to. That when I was reading to them the ijaza, the sanad of the hadith, that I was teaching them, I, I pointed out something very interesting. That for the first 18 generations, almost 20 generations, through which hadith came to us, 
you find the majority of the narrators of these hadith saying that my father I heard this hadith from my father, I heard this hadith from my mother, I heard this hadith from my grandfather, I heard this hadith from my older brother, I heard this hadith from my uncle. You actually find more of that. And then you notice in the last five to seven generations, that stops happening. Where it's more of, I heard this hadith from my teacher. And whereas there's nothing wrong with, of course, maybe if your father is not a scholar, you're eventually going to have to go on and learn deen from someone else. But it's a very, very interesting observation that for the first so many hundred years, right, for the majority of our history as an ummah, knowledge, so basically these were scholars, but before they were passing their knowledge out, they were distributing their knowledge, they were giving their knowledge, teaching their ilm to random strangers. They were actually first and foremost teaching it to their own children that the early, the early generation of scholars, the classical scholars, their, their main students when they would pass, their primary students and their main students often used to be their own kids, their own children, their own grandchildren. And so it was a very family-oriented approach to deen. So we see that from the life of the Prophet ﷺ, that one of the also, this is a very fair and this is a very astute um, observation and, and a, uh, a wisdom, a, a gem that is extracted by the classical scholars for about this time period, this life, this, this time from the life of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ from the age of 25 to 35, that another reason why there aren't some major incidents or events to narrate, it's because the Prophet ﷺ was very heavily invested into his own family. And that's why what I said last week was, the Prophet of Allah ﷺ is uswatun hasana, is the ultimate role model. But you know what the thing about being a role model is? If, if I haven't experienced what you are going through, like so for instance, if somebody's in medical school, somebody's becoming a doctor, I can't be a role model for him in terms of medicine. Like I can't advise him in terms of his medical career. I can't. I have no credibility. I have no knowledge. I have no background. Even if I tried to, that would actually be very foolish on my part. Because I have no credibility. How am I supposed to tell him, you know, where to apply for residency or what type of programs or what to specialize in? I have no idea. I don't know anything about medicine. I would tell him to go and speak to another medical doctor. Right? So the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa to be our role model in life and to be our advisor in family, it necessitates, it necessitates that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa be the ultimate family man. For him to be able to give us marriage advice, it necessitates that he be the best husband that ever walked the face of this earth. In order for him to tell us how to raise our kids, it necessitates that the Prophet of Allah ﷺ be the best father of all time. That he be the most amazing father that ever walked the face of this earth. And that's exactly who the Messenger of Allah ﷺ was. And I'll end this little you know, rant if you will. By, by saying that, by ending where I started, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِي That the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him, said, that the best amongst you is the one who is the best to his family. And I am the best amongst you to my family. I treat my family the best. I treat my family better than everybody else. And that's why the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was our role model. So from the age of 25 to 35, we don't have any major incidents or events or occurrences from the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. But even there, there's a, even then there's a lesson and there's some wisdom for us to extract. And that is basically what we just talked about. So after having said that, we are basically fast forwarding to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the age of 35. So now we're going to be talking about the Prophet of Allah وسلم, at the age of 35. That is where a major event and an incident occurred with the Prophet of Allah وسلم. This is of course still pre-Prophethood, pre nubuwa but something very interesting. If you remember in the earlier sessions on the seerah, talking about before the birth of the Prophet وسلم, and if you weren't able to attend or listen to those particular sessions, you can go back to the recordings to the podcast, and particularly the, the sessions that are labeled as 
the well of Zamzam and the army of the elephants. If you go back and you listen to that, one thing that we talked about that we that, that was specifically pointed out that that comes from the classical text on the Sirah, the life of the Prophet ﷺ, is that immediately, very close in the years leading up to, and even the months leading up to the birth of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, some very very interesting things happened. The well of Zamzam was rediscovered. And the scholars say that that's not a coincidence. That is not a coincidence that the well of Zamzam was rediscovered shortly before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ because it was a sign foretelling of the coming of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. It was kind of like the gates of barakah and blessing being reopened upon humanity to welcome the birth of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. In the months leading up to the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, the invasion by the army of the elephants, Abraha and his army of elephants occurred. Once, and then they were dispatched they were basically defeated, they were taken care of again very miraculously. Once again, not a coincidence. This occurred again as a major sign foretelling of the coming of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, that the doors of the barakah, the blessing, and the miracles of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala manifesting themselves on the face of this earth was being initiated so that again to welcome the birth of the Messenger of Allah, peace and blessings be upon him. Similarly, we have some, a major incident taking place years, of, in the years leading up to the beginning of divine revelation, wahi. Again, as a welcoming and as a foretelling of the doors of divine revelation being reopened for the last and the final time upon humanity. And that, that would be the revelation, um, divine inspiration and the revelation of the Qur'an to Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him. So when the Prophet of Allah ﷺ was about 35 years old, one of the major events that occurred in the life of the Prophet ﷺ was the renovation of the Kaaba. And in fact, from what we're going to discuss today, it wasn't just simply a renovation, but rather it was a complete reconstruction of the Kaaba. A complete reconstruction of the Baytullah. So there are a few different narrations which give us different pieces of the puzzle. Some of the historians mention that overall, just due to you know the, the time passing by, that the Kaaba, the Baytullah, and had been many, 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 many years, possibly centuries, since the Baytullah, since the Kaaba had been renovated or reconstructed in any way, shape or form. So the wear and tear had been very bad upon the Baytullah, upon the Kaaba, and so overall it was just starting to fall apart. Secondly, on top of that, we have another narration mentioned by Ibn Ishaq, that, <clears throat> that what happened at that time was the Kaaba, the Baytullah used to be very... Like if you've ever visited the, the Kaaba, or even if you've seen a picture, one of the very, uh, thing, very first things you'll notice about the Baytullah, now I'm talking about the Baytullah, the Kaaba, Al-Kaaba to Sharifa itself. One of the very um, first things that you'll notice about it is, it is very, very tall. It's very, very tall. But back in those days, it was basically a third of the height that it is right now. So the histor or, or even less than that actually. So the historians mentioned that it was about seven arms lengths. Six to seven arm lengths, or so that would basically be six to seven meters high. And that was the height of the Baytullah, of the Kaaba uh, at that time. The time of the, uh, the early years of the Prophet of Allah Now due to that, when you go to the Baytullah, one of the things that you notice is because it is so tall and it's so high, that the door, the bab, the door of the Kaaba is also very, very high, it's elevated. But because the Kaaba itself was a lot shorter, was less than a third of the height that it is today, the door was also a lot lower. So the door was basically at ground's length. And what had happened because of that was, unfortunately, the Kaaba, when some of the books of history mentioned this, that unfortunately, very unfortunately, that the Kaaba had been broken into. The Kaaba had been broken into, and because all of Arabia considered to be considered it to be so sacred, they considered it to be so sacred, even though they were idol worshippers and idolatrous. But nevertheless, they can still 
considered it to be very sacred, nobody would dare ever violate the Kaaba in this way. Nobody would break into it. And on top of that, in fact, it's also mentioned in the books of history that the, the mushrikun, whatever fund, whatever public fund that they had for the Kaaba, the Kaaba fund, the, the, whatever fund that they had, which was gold and silver and some valuables, they actually used to go ahead and just keep it in the Kaaba. Because that was the safest place where you could put it. Because nobody would dare violate the Kaaba. They were much too scared. They, they, they respected it way too much to violate it. So they would keep the, the, the goods, the funds inside of there, the gold and silver inside of there. So somebody had actually broken, in, broken into it and stolen some of the funds of the Kaaba, some of the gold and silver that was stashed inside. So then you have a second reason. Number one, it was becoming dilapidated. Number two, somebody actually broke into it and robbed it, looted it. Number three, the books of history also mentioned that there were some floods in Mecca at that time. That they had some very, very torrid rains during, in, in Mecca during that time. They had some very, very bad weather. And Mecca had started to flood. And because of that as well, the walls of the Kaaba had become severely damaged. Do, they had basically received a lot of water damage to the point where it was leaking and they were, they were worrying about you know, water leaking into the Kaaba and it becoming flooded and just becoming you know, destroyed over time. So with all these factors combined, they said it's about time that we reconstructed the Kaaba. We gotta fix it. And this wasn't just simple patchwork. Because the walls had become so severely damaged, they realized that they basically had to reconstruct it. They would have to tear it down and they would have to build it back up again. But that was a problem. Because again, they considered it to be so sacred, they were very nervous about doing so. And you also have to take into consideration the simple fact that these, these were not people who, whose belief system was based upon any type of you know, theology or belief system. These were very superstitious, idol-worshipping people. So they were very nervous about making any major changes to the Kaaba, even if it be for you know, reconstructing it and solidifying the structure. They said if we tear it down, what if we're punished by God, by the, by the idols or by the gods, and what if bad things happen to us? And so they're very superstitious. So now they realize they got to do something about it, but nobody's willing to actually do something about it. At this point in time, the... It mentions actually a few very, very interesting narrations. Um, one, of, one of the men of Quraysh, who is actually a distant relative of the Prophet of Allah wasallam, he was basically the uncle, the maternal uncle of the fa father of the Prophet of Allah So he was the brother of the Prophet wasallam's grandmother. The Prophet wasallam's jadda, his grandmother from his father's side, this was his grandmother's brother. So he was the Prophet's great uncle. He finally stood up, and they were having discussions, and they'd been discussing this literally for days, but nobody would actually kind of get up and get started because they were just so terrified, and they were scared to do anything, that he finally stood up and he said, I'll be the very first one, I'm gonna go ahead and get this started. And he basically went and one of the walls that was literally falling apart, he grabbed one of the stones, one of the rocks and moved it from its place. Now, something very interesting, the books of Sirah, the books of history, and these, many of these narrations are actually authenticated. Um, it mentions something very interesting. That when he removed this, 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 um, this stone from its place, it and he put it down on the ground, it basically, the stone on its own, moved, literally flew back and lodged itself back into the place where it had been removed. And you can imagine, so now these Quraysh, the people of Mecca are all there, they're already nervous, they're already very, very scared of approaching, you know, reconstructing the Kaaba. And one of them finally says, look, we're doing it for the good of the Kaaba itself, what's the problem? You know, this, this shouldn't really be a problem. And he goes and he grabs, um, a stone from there and the stone literally flies back into its spot and lodges back into its place. Now they're completely freaked out. Now they're like, what do we do? And so what he says at that time is, he explains to them, and this might have just been his own personal firasa, but he basically explains to them, he says that, <clears throat> 
Quraysh, listen, this is a sign from Allah, this is a sign from God, from the rub of this bait, that we need to approach the reconstruction of the Kaaba very carefully. And he gives them a strategy. He says, number one, we're not going to tear it all down all at once. We're going to like almost reconstruct it a piece at a time. We're going to take it down one wall at a time and reconstruct it and then to go take the other wall down and reconstruct and take the third wall down, etc. So we're going to do this bit by bit, piece by piece to seem more respectful. Number two, he says that this stone flying back into its place is a sign from Allah for the simple fact that only pure can be put into this reconstruction of the Kaaba. Because we've talked about, and again you can go back and listen to the earlier sessions, but what was the condition of the Arab, specifically in Mecca, and specifically the Quraysh, before the, before the birth of the Prophet ﷺ, and even during that early years of the Prophet of Allah ﷺ, what was kind of their condition, and what was their state? That they were basically people who stole a lot, who were very heavily involved in users, transactions, they were involved in interest and riba, they were you know, very heavily involved in different types of you know, shamelessness, prostitution was a big business at that time, they used to gamble a lot, different things like this. So basically a huge stream of their money and their income was coming from bad places. What we would refer to as haram income. So he says to them at that time that we need to make sure we put pure wealth into this. So everybody needs to go back, find good pure wealth that they can find that doesn't have any effects or influences of interest, riba, alcohol, sales, usury, um, gambling, prostitution, stealing. None of this is involved. It's pure income. And gather as much as you can together and bring it and we're basically going to invest that into the Kaaba, into the Baytullah. Now one obvious lesson that comes from this, and this is very prominently mentioned by the scholars, that this was the ethics and the morals, and the, the, the awareness, the consciousness, that the mushrikun of Makkah had about what type of wealth to put into the Baytullah, into the Kaaba, into the house of God. And so we as the Ummah of the Prophet ﷺ now having the complete deen, and obviously realizing that these types of incomes or sources of income are obviously haram and impermissible, how careful should we be about the type of wealth that we put into the house of Allah? That we should be very careful and we should be very particular. And we should make no mistake that it has uh, an effect on the overall barakah and blessing of our work and of our community that it directly depends on the type of wealth that we invest into it. And we have to be very careful that we don't create some type of a culture or mentality, a mindset of, you know like people who are involved in like, um, people who are involved in like money laundering, or they're involved in gambling or crime, or selling drugs, or doing bad things like that, they usually try to have their money, like they need somebody to basically kind of legitimize their money. They look for somebody to kind of, I wouldn't know this from personal experience, just clarifying that, right? I've seen, I've watched TV just like everybody else, so... But typically what you see or what we, what we hear, or what we've been told is that they basically look for somebody to be able to legitimize their money for them. That how their money can become legit, can become legitimate. Alright, so they don't get busted, they don't get caught. We have to make sure that we don't turn masjid and Islamic organizations into that type of a, a, a filter for people, at least in the minds of people. It doesn't work as that type of filter. If I sell alcohol, or if I steal money from people, or if I engage in a haram business, then if I come and just donate that, that to, to the masjid, it doesn't automatically now remove sin from me. It's not like some type of purification process. It doesn't work that way. But we have to make sure we don't enable that type of behavior in the community either. And so we don't, we, at the same time, we're not, we don't create a culture of where we investigate people. We're not the FBI. All right? We have to make sure we don't become the Muslim FBI. We don't go around investigating people. But we just have to have education. We have to have awareness. And we cannot shy away from the fact that where we have to emphasize to our community that earn a lawful form of income, Islamically speaking, spiritually lawful form of income. And when you bring money to the masjid, to the community, to sadaqah, to charity, then also bring the purest of your wealth. Bring pure income. 
Because this is a spiritual religious cause. The mushrikun of Makkah had more sense than that. Idol worshippers had greater sense than that. So we have to be very conscious of that fact. So this is the strategy that it gives them. We're going to do it bit by bit, piece at a time. Number two, we're going to be very conscious and very careful about the type of money that we're going to bring here to basically invest and construct uh, and renovate the Kaaba, the Baytullah. So this is kind of the strategy with which they approach it. Um, just before, so that I tackle a little piece at a time. What time is Salat al-Isha? 9.15, okay. We'll go for about 10 more minutes, inshallah. So, now they begin the, the process. Now what do, we, what do they do? So the books of Sira, the books of history actually mentioned that the very first thing that they... Well, first of all, obviously, a fight breaks out. Um, or, uh, before I actually even go there, some of the books of Sira, some of the books of Sira even mentioned that one of the other things that occurred in order to emphasize to these mushrikun of Makkah to be very careful about the reconstruction of the Kaaba and to only bring the purest of their wealth in reconstructing the Kaaba was that when they initially started kind of approaching it to reconstruct it, that at that time there was a well. There was a well that was near the Kaaba, not the well of Zamzam it's talked about, but another well that was near the Kaaba that had been empty and kind of boarded up, an abandoned well for quite a long, long time. That a huge snake, like a serpent, like an anaconda type of looking thing, right? Like a huge snake came bursting out of that well that boarded up that abandoned well and it basically started circling around the Kaaba. It started circling around the Kaaba. And one of the narrations actually says that it was going up and down over the walls of the Kaaba. And there's even some of the books of history actually mention what it looked like, where it had a black head and a white... Uh, no, the underbelly of the snake was white, and the, the body of the snake was black. And the head of the snake was really huge. And whenever anybody would try to even come close or come near it, it would actually lift its head up, and it would hiss at them, and it would open its mouth at that person. So it was scaring and frightening the people away. And again, when that basically happened, they, that they took that as another sign as to, we need to be careful, and we need to be cautious about how to approach the reconstruction of the Kaaba, and they basically eventually kind of made kind of a pact amongst themselves, and they announced it. Like almost like announcing it to that snake. Saying that we will only put pure wealth here, and we'll be very careful, and we'll do it bit by bit, piece by piece, little by little, and we'll be very cautious and careful and respectful in reconstructing the Kaaba. And what happened at that time was they say that the snake basically receded away from there and just kind of disappeared out into the wilderness. One other uh, narration actually mentions that a huge bird, like a condor type of looking bird, flew in from the sky, snatched up that snake and then took it away. Wallahu ta'ala alam bisawab, Allah knows best. But these are some of the accounts that are mentioned in the books of history. Nevertheless, they understood that they needed to be careful. Alright, so that being said, now a fight broke out. Obviously you can assume what the fight was about, right? The fight was, who's gonna do the reconstruction of the Kaaba? So each of the major families, they started Banu Adi and Banu Kilab and Banu Hashim and now they're all fighting. And they're saying that we, we're going to do it, we're going to do it, we're going to do it. So much so that some of the books of history actually mentioned that they started taking blood oaths. They started taking blood oaths where what they would do is they would literally like, you know, cut themselves and go and, you know, stamp their blood onto the Kaaba. And they would take an oath saying that, I, you know, we swear by this house that we will be the ones who will reconstruct this. They started taking blood oaths. And they actually started to kind of affiliate, like ally with each other. So the two other tribes are getting together and saying, okay, look, Banu Hashim, they're the big dogs. Banu Hashim, they're the guys that are, that are the real um, threat here. Alright, we have to worry about them. So why don't we ally together and we'll defeat the Banu Hashim together and then we'll get to reconstruct the Kaaba together. So it started getting that bad. So he said, what do we do? So it said that one of the le senior leaders of uh, Mecca, Walid bin Mughira, he actually stood up and he said that we're all going to do this together. 
We're all going to do this together. And what he does is, he says that each tribe will be given a portion. Each family, each family or each tribe will be given a portion of the Kaaba that they will reconstruct. And so everybody that way has a share, has a stake. And there, Ibn Ishaq actually mentions that the door, the side of the door of the Kaaba was given to Banu Abd Munaf and Banu Zuhra. And between the Al-Hajr Al-Aswad and the Ruk Al-Yamani, that was given to Banu Makhzum and the Qaba'il, and some of the Qaba'il of the Quraysh were joined with them. The back side, the opposite side of the Kaaba from the door, so whenever it says Zahrul Kaaba, it means that the wall of the Kaaba that has the door, the opposite side of that. So the other side, that was given to the Banu Jumah and Banu Saham. And then the, the, the side of the Hijr, the side of the Hijr, which is basically where the Hatim is. If you ever visit the Kaaba, or even if you go and take a look online, you have, that, you have the Hatim. That, that, that is originally portion, part of the Kaaba, but it was left out of the construction. So that's why when we do tawaf, we go from around it. And that's why we're encouraged to try to go and pray there inside of the Hatim. Because if you pray inside of the Hatim, it's, like, it's as if you prayed inside of the Kaaba. So that portion of the Hatim was given to Banu Adi bin Ka'b. Alright, and these were their portions that were given to them. Now everybody's happy. Everybody's okay, everybody's alright. Okay, everybody's gonna get to take part in this. So it was just a compromise. Alright? But now they're back at square one. Because whatever narration you would like to take from that, whether the stone flying back into its place, or a snake and a bird, and all this stuff happening, they're freaked out. So now that it's time to actually do something, they're all just kind of sitting around being like, all right, Bismillah, go ahead guys. You guys get started. They're like, no, Bismillah, you get started. No, 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 you go ahead, please, please. Right, so they're all hope, holding the door open for each other. Like, Bismillah, you go ahead, you go ahead. No, no, you go ahead, brother, you go ahead. Right? So now they're all, mashallah, very courteous. A little while ago, they were like taking blood oaths, and I'm gonna kill you, and I'm gonna kill your family. And now they're like, no, you first. No, please, you first. Right? Because they're all freaked out. So finally, Walid bin Mughira. He says, وَأَنَا أَبْدَأُكُمْ I'll start. And he grabs an axe or a hammer and he goes up there and he gets started and he kind of breaks off a little chunk of the wall and starts to kind of tear it down and break it down. And he goes, he goes ahead and gets started. And he does a little bit, because this literally happens in the evening. All day long they've been saying, you go, no you go, no you go. I gotta use the, use the restroom real quick. You go ahead and get started, we'll be right back. Right? Oh, it's lunchtime. So huh, what are we gonna do? We gotta have lunch now, right? So they've been making excuses all day long. And so finally evening time comes, Walid bin Mughira is so frustrated. So he gets up and he just gets started, but he doesn't get too much done before it's dark. Now what they all say is they're like, all right, let's see what happens tonight. Because if something bad happens to him tonight, then that means we shouldn't do it. So he's now the, the, the guinea pig, the test, you know, the, the, he's, the, he's, the, he's the test product. So they decide, let's see what happens with him. Morning time comes, and bright and early in the morning, the very first person who shows up for the reconstruction project is Walid bin Mughira. He's fine, he's healthy, he says, I had a great night's sleep, got really good rest, I'm really excited to kind of, you know, uh, resume with the reconstruction of the Kaaba, and everybody sees, okay, he's all good, nothing happened to him, so this must be okay. The Rabb of the Bayt must be pleased with this. So then they go ahead and get started. It also actually mentions in a narration that when Walid bin Mughira stands up, and he goes to kind of, you know, take the first part of that wall down. He says, Allahumma la tura'. Allahumma inna la nuridu illa al-khayr. He says that, you're basically speaking to the Rabb of the Bayt. He says that we don't mean any offense. Please don't be offended by what we're doing. We, we only want to do khayr. We only want to better this Bayt, better the Kaaba, better the house of God. And so, now they begin the reconstruction of the Kaaba. And, you know, they, they proceed with the reconstruction and it's, all going very, very well. Now here comes another very interesting thing. So when they kind of tear, you know, the, they're tearing the wall down and they get to the base of the wall. They get to the base of the wall. They basically hit 
what the books of Sirah and the books of Hadith mention as the asas of Ibrahim alayhi salam. They reached the foundation that Ibrahim alayhi salam had laid. The original foundation. And here there's a little bit of a side topic and a side tangent. I'm going to save this basically for next week. But there's even a whole discussion and a whole little, if you will, like a topic about the overall history of the Kaaba. When was the foundation of the Kaaba originally laid? And by whom was it laid? Was it laid before Ibrahim alayhi salam or not? And what about, you know, their narrations which talk about different prophets visiting the place of the Kaaba and all of that leading up to the time of the Prophet wasallam, and then even kind of giving a brief history and account as to what happened in the first hundred years after the Prophet of Allah wasallam, in the first century of Islam, what basically occurred with the Kaaba that brought it to the place and the general structure of where we see it today. I'm not talking about the outside area. The Masjid al-Haram, that of course, you know, it's updated every decade or so. That's different, right? I'm talking about the Kaaba, al kaaba al-Sharifa itself, the Murabba, the square itself. Alright? So talking about that. So what I'll do next week is inshallah, I'll touch on that topic where overall discussing the history of the Kaaba, when it was laid, the foundation, how it went through different phases of construction. And in the first century of Islam, some major things happened with the Kaaba, which eventually concluded with it being in the form that we see it, the general basic form that we see it, uh, we see it in today. All right? But nevertheless here, when they kind of started to tear it down, they reached the base of the wall, they reached the asas of Ibrahim. They reached the foundation that was laid by Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so some of the narrations, um, and Imam Bukhari talks about this as well. Imam Bayhaqi speaks about this in a lot of detail. And of course, Ibn Ishaq and the other historians speak about this in a lot of detail. That they describe that foundation, they describe that asas. And they say that they were green colored rocks. Now whether they had become green over time or whatever it was, but they were kind of greenish in color. Alright? That they were green greenish colored rocks and that they were kind of jagged. They were rough and they were kind of jagged. And they were, they were kind of pinned up against each other. So they weren't straight rocks. So that tells you, that's something very practical. As you can imagine, at the time of Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was laying the foundation of the Kaaba, he really couldn't actually go and buy a bunch of bricks. Right, he could have, couldn't put in an order for a bunch of bricks. So they didn't have straight bricks to lay down. So they were, they were in the mountains. Nobody lived there. He didn't have a lot of tools. So they basically took whatever rocks and stones they could find and just kind of started piecing them and puzzling them together. So when they get there, these are all these jagged rocks that are kind of, you know, uh, leaned up against each other and supporting each other. And they're kind of greenish, moldish in color. And they were, and, and they described them as kal asnan. They were almost like teeth. Like imagine kind of like crooked, jagged teeth. That's what they were like. And when they reached that, they tried to kind of grab that with their hands, but they had been there for so long that they really couldn't move them. They couldn't make them budge. So they basically gave up on it. And they said, you know what? This foundation seems really, really solid. It seems like it's kind of like settled into the earth now. It's like basically a part of the ground now. Why, don't, why, why are we messing with this? Why don't we just leave it, leave it and we'll build from on top of it. Solid foundation, why are you going to mess with that? One the narration says, Ibn Ishaq mentions this, Imam Bayhaqi mentions this, that a man came, kind of saying, he brought like a big, like some type of a tool, like a big, you know, um, iron rod or something like that. And he says, I'm going to fix this. Here, let me show you how it's done. So he brings his big iron rod and he jams it in between two of the rocks and he tries to, you know how you do with a crowbar? So he jams it in there and he starts slamming on it trying to crack them out of place. And then the narration says that as soon as he does that and he starts like kind of trying to crack it into place, they said that the entire earth in Makkah shook. The entire earth, like the ground, the whole city of Makkah shook. Like it caused like a mini earthquake. It was like a warning sign. That back off, leave it be. And as soon as the earth shook, Makkah shook literally, they all told him, they're like, listen, take it easy there guy. Jazakallah, but no Jazakallah. Right? <laughs> thanks, but no thanks. Alright, we'll be okay. So 
they basically told them to back off and all of the Quraysh, the Meccans, everybody that was there for the construction decided this, and of course they identified with Ibrahim alayhi salam. They knew, they were conscious, they knew who Ibrahim alayhi salam was. So they said this must be the foundation laid by our great, 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 great grandfather, Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so we should leave it be, this is sacred, this is... Uh, this is sacred, and this is something that obviously the rub of the bait does not want us to disturb, and we should leave it be. And they basically left that as it was, and they started constructing and building on top of that. We'll go ahead and we're going to stop here. Next week we'll continue on with the construction, the reconstruction of the Kaaba, and we'll talk about what happened. There's of course that very famous, some people might already know, the very famous story of the completion of the reconstruction of the Kaaba, that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, was basically the centerpiece of, he was, he was very instrumental in the final... Uh, part of the reconstruction of the Kaaba. And we'll talk about all that inshallah next week. And then we'll also give the brief historical account of the Baytullah of the Kaaba in next week's session as well. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us uh, the ability to practice everything we've said and heard. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us true love for Allah and His Messenger. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.